uh, completely out of breath. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we're looking at Acts chapter 17, verses 13 through 15. Acts chapter 17 and verses 13 through 15. You recall what's been going on here. The Apostle Paul has gotten down to Berea. We find Thessalonica, he had some persecution. They get out of town, they make it down to Berea. They have a tremendous response at Berea, and we talked about that last week. And tonight we discover that there were some people at Thessalonica who heard that the Apostle Paul had gone down to Berea. And as a result, they decided to track him down there. Uh, same story, just a different verse. In Paul's missionary journeys, we find him being constantly hounded, constantly persecuted, constantly tracked. They don't merely settle with running him out of town. They want to track him down where he's going next. And then they want to track him down where he's going next. And we saw that with Iconium and Lystra uh, earlier in our studies. Uh, the Apostle Paul was an effective missionary. Either he had tremendous success or he had tremendous persecution. Either people came to Christ in droves or else droves of people drove him away. And so tonight we're looking at verses 13 through 15. Let me give us the background here once again for what we were last week, where we see a tremendous response with the uh, believers. There were several immediate observations that we needed to make about this. Um, the brethren, as you recall, had sent Paul and Silas by night to Berea. Uh, they got away under the cover of darkness. We find Paul is going to be doing a lot of this kind of stuff in the, the next few trips that he makes here, where he is going away and people are not able to follow him because of the ruses that are used by the other Christians. And we'll talk about that tonight. Is that a legitimate thing to do? Yes, it is a legitimate thing to do. It says he came to the synagogue of the Jews in verse 10. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. And we made a few observations about that text last week, which are important for us to remember. The entire church was involved in the protection of Paul and Silas. We're going to see that again tonight. Our text tonight makes it clear that the entire church is involved in protecting Paul and Silas, not just Jason and the other who was living at his house. Paul had formed already in three weeks a very cohesive group of believers. How quickly they had gelled, how they had been molded together into an acting unit when the murderous mob came looking for the Apostle Paul and wanted to kill him. Then we talked about using the cover of night to help Paul and Silas escape. It's not wrong when the situation requires to do everything morally permissible to evade the enemy. We don't have to uh, get out there and pretend like we're martyrs for Jesus and then let the crowd beat us up and kill us. The third thing that I think was very important was the brethren had a specific plan in mind. They thought quickly. We're going to talk about quick thinking tonight because there has to be some quick thinking going on in the text that we look at tonight. But there's some very quick thinking that goes on here. Uh, some survivor skills, if you will. And I'll share with you some stories of when we get down to that part of our text for tonight. But it is very quick thinking. They have a plan in mind. They didn't just send Paul and Silas away. They sent them to a specific location. They sent them to the next synagogue, which was at Berea. We talked about we don't know how how they knew about that synagogue, whether there was a connection between the two groups of Jews, uh, whether or not there were people there at the synagogue in Thessalonica who knew that there would be somebody there at Berea who would receive the message that Paul had. We don't know whether or not the rabbis at those two synagogues uh, had uh, connections with each, each other. But they had a specific plan in mind. They executed a specific plan. They executed it speedily. They did not wait around for it. Uh, and Paul and Silas got away by night. Nothing is said about Paul and Silas having to canvass the area or hunt for the synagogue. They knew right where to go. The fourth, fifth thing was that it may be implied that they were sent out on a Friday night because apparently they arrived on a Saturday morning when the synagogue worship was taking place. That would make sense because they go directly to the synagogue and a worship service is in progress. They were only at Berea for three Sabbaths before the riot occurred, so they would have been spirited secretly out of Thessalonica before the fourth Saturday. And then we looked at that word, sent away. 
uh, which indicated that the fledgling church of Thessalonica, after only three weeks, made physical provision for Paul and Silas on their journey, food, money, clothing, and other necessities. And we talked about the difference between the different words for to send away, ekpempo, and not apostello, which is where the apostles are sent on their journeys as apostles, apostello, you can hear the word apostle uh, coming out of that word there, which is an orderly departure, but ekpempo emphasizes the need for haste, but it also includes the concept of bestowing things that is, meeting the needs of the ones who are sent out in haste. Then we talked about that word more noble, eugenes, well-born, high in rank, being a nobleman or a gentleman, uh, but clearly we're not talking about the world's concept of eugenes here in this passage, but it's God's viewpoint of these. That's the way God saw them, because not many so of the social status of the eugenes, the more noble, are among the elect, and we saw that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 through 29, where the Apostle Paul says so. We know that that's not nearly a description of their genetic heritage, because we're told specifically in the text, uh, in the next text, that they were more noble uh, at Berea than those at Thessalonica. <clears throat> We saw why they were more noble in the sight of God was, number one, they received the word. That's key if you want to be noble in the sight of God. You have to listen to what he says. What he says does not come through visions and dreams and revelations anymore. It comes through the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. We did not receive the spirit by the works of the law, but we received the Holy Spirit by the hearing of faith. Galatians 3.2 we exercise our spiritual gifts through the Spirit and by the hearing of faith. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Faith in the Word of God. Faith is complete confidence in the Word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the Sovereign God reveals himself to be. You've heard me give that definition. I wrote that definition perhaps 40 years ago and it sticks every place you find in Scripture. Faith is complete confidence in the Word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the Sovereign God reveals Himself to be. The second key that we saw in that text was readiness of mind. They had a willing mind, it says. They were forward in spirit. They wanted to learn. They were eager. They had alacrity when it came to absorbing biblical truth. That was a spirit in which the churches of Macedonia gave financial support. We saw that that same word was used there. Although they were financially poor and not rich noblemen, the same word was used in their giving that was used for the eagerness of the Bereans in the studying of Scripture. Now, if you think about the Bereans and you think, wow, that's really good. They were really eager to study the Word of God. Just remember, that's the word that we used for people who were financially poor when they eagerly gave to meet the needs of the poor brethren at Jerusalem who were even in worse shape than they were. Eagerness to give, eagerness in the scripture. And we saw that the, that the Macedonian churches, which included Berea, were supposed to be an example to the Corinthian church. Those believers who had suffered persecution in Thessalonica and in Berea and in the other cities of Macedonia were the ones who were used as the example for the church at Corinth to get busy and quit dragging their feet. We talked about that last week. A lot of us tend to drag our feet with things that we don't want to do, things that we'd rather not do, things that are a little, well, they irritate us, they're a little obnoxious and we wish we didn't have to do them and we hope somebody else would do them instead. Paul says the church at Corinth was that way. Just remember the church at Corinth was the most carnal church in the entire New Testament. They didn't get their job done. They put it off. They waited for somebody else to do it. Then we saw that not only readiness of mind dealt with the uh, issue of willingness to do something, but it has to be in the right position for spiritual growth and relationship with God. And we saw that in Romans 12, 1 and 2, verses that you all know. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God.
demonstrate visibly. That's what that word to prove means, to demonstrate visibly. It's not working out a mathematical formula as a proof. It's talking about visibly demonstrating in the way that you live that your mind is in the right position for spiritual growth and for service to the living God. The third key that we looked at in that text last week was they searched, anacrino. We saw that that was to investigate thoroughly from the word for judging, crino, and ana, which used as a prefix indicates repetition, intensity, and fervor. They didn't just look into their Bibles once and then go home, stretch and yawn, and say, well, let's see what he has to say next week, and then he wasn't there next week because he had to leave town. It says they searched, they thoroughly investigated with repetition, they thoroughly investigated with intensity the scriptures sort of in-depth Bible study, I think, is going on here at Berea. And then, um, and it was not a lackadaisical, well, every other day kind of a thing where they read their Bibles. It says the scriptures. They search the scriptures. The answer is not in commentaries. The answer is not in books on religion. The answer is not in ethical philosophy. The answer is not in comparative religious ideas. The touchstone is scripture. How much time do you spend in scripture versus how much time you spend doing everything else? Think about your day as you go through the day. You know you have to get a certain amount of sleep. For so he giveth his beloved sleep, it says so in the Psalms. But how much time do you spend in bed? Is it beyond what is necessary? A lot of us like to just sort of lollygag around when we have the opportunity. Holiday comes around, we stay in bed for an extra three hours. Saturday comes around, we don't have to go to work today. We hang out in bed for maybe two hours, stay around in our bathrobe for another two hours, maybe get us a cup of coffee, wander down and look at whatever the news is going on, and then sort of saunter through the day. That's not the picture that we have here. The fifth key was daily. Nothing should stand in the way of our time with the Word of God. I don't know if you do this. I do this. I try to wake up at 4.30 every morning so I can spend time in prayer and then spend time in the Word of God. I used to do that with Judy. It's a lot more difficult now that she's with the Lord in heaven. But we used to get up every morning at 4.30 and we would pray together uh, before we would have our Bible reading time. And we did that. We'd often pray for sometimes an hour and a half to two hours. That's before anybody would ring the phone, before anybody would be knocking at the door, even before our kids would call us. <laughs> our kids knew that we prayed early in the morning, so they didn't interrupt us, even though they knew they could get away with it because they are children. But um, we had a commitment all the way back to before we were married. When we were engaged, we got up every morning before all the rest of the school got up. We read for an hour out of the Hebrew Old Testament and translated we read for an hour out of the Greek New Testament and translated. It's during that period of time that God drew us together so that I asked her to marry me, and the morning that I asked her to marry me, she said yes. The scripture was central as a bond not only between us, but our bond with the Heavenly Father. Spending time in the Word of God. And that was sort of the foundation, the cornerstone of our marriage. How much time do you spend in the Word of God? Do you sacrifice to spend time in the Word of God, or is it a, a secondary thought? If you have time, you'll spend it in the Word of God, not the Word of God comes first, everything else comes second. The Bereans, for them, the Word of God was first. You know, you need to set and, and then stick with it. And stick with it, because the devil will try to find ways to get you to change it or to eliminate it. You need to find a specific time where it is your time with God, where you are learning from Him, where you are studying His Word, and then let nothing interrupt it. There may be an occasional crisis whereby you know you get sick and have to go to the hospital or something, but it should be a daily thing they search the scriptures daily, it says. That is, they investigated thoroughly with repetition, with intensity, and with, further, with, with a fervor the scriptures every day. My personal opinion is that you should set a time of no less than 30 minutes per day. No less. Certainly you can spend more. 
but no less than 30 minutes a day to be in the Word. You know, I think if all of us were honest and we added up the time that we use to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we spend at least 30 minutes every day stuffing our mouths with food. Do you think that your spirit should have less time in the Word than your stomach has with junk food? With going out to eat? You spend time going out to eat. You spend money going out to eat. You're using resources that God has given you. And so you spend time and money on that. Do you spend time and money in the study of the Word of God? Suppose you took, over an average year, the same amount of money that you use to buy meals that you eat out. And you go ahead and buy your meals and you eat out and so on, but you calculate the money that you spent. And you figure how many hundreds or thousands of dollars, if you eat out every day at least just once a day, if you only spend five dollars during that, you've spent over fifteen hundred dollars a year just eating one meal a day out at only five dollars. And most of us, if we eat out, spend more than five dollars. Fifteen hundred dollars minimum if you eat out just once a day. And then you take that same amount of money and you buy Bible study tools. Or you purchase a course whereby you can begin to teach yourself Greek or Hebrew. What? A layman learning Greek or Hebrew? Yes. We taught our kids that in homeschool. And it has stood them in very good stead all of these years. They still are excited when I give them for Christmas presents commentaries or Greek and Hebrew manuals or things that deal with the Greek and Hebrew text. Do you give things like that to your kids who are doctors? Yes, I sure do. Because they have a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God. What if you took $1,500 this year? Even at maximum prices, you could buy yourself an awful lot of study tools to study the Scripture and then use them in your quiet time. You don't understand a particular phrase? So you, you pull down a, a, a Greek commentary that is dealing with the Greek text. There are a lot of them out there. There's Robertson, there's A.T. Robertson, there's uh, Nicole, there's uh, Wiest. There are multiple multi-volume commentaries on the New Testament that deal with the Greek text. And you begin to look at the words that are there and then you begin to track those words and you take your Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and I've taught you how to use a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and you begin to go through you look at that word in English and then you see the little numbers off to the right and you look down the columns and you see every place that that word shows up because it'll have the same little number that is by your verse and then you look those up you say man that's a lot of work you're right it's like mining for diamonds it's like taking your pickaxe and digging in the earth looking for gold. It's a lot of work. It's like panning for gold during the 1849 gold rush in California where people left everything they had on the East Coast because they desired the gold so much and they went out there and many of them suffered tremendous hardships and some of them died. How much do you love the Word of God? They searched intense, fervent searching repetitive searching, day after day searching the scriptures. That's the mine. That's where the diamonds are found. That's where the gold is found. Every single day. The prospectors didn't wait until it was high noon. They struggled out of their sleeping bags and rolled over and spent a couple hours frying themselves a couple of pancakes and eggs while everybody else was down at the stream panning for gold. They got up as early as they could. They worked from before dawn until after dusk because they knew that what they were going to find was valuable. Do you do it? You know, we have our priorities wrong, folks. We have our priorities wrong. They searched daily. Let me show you from just a few verses of Scripture. We did not go over this last week. I want to give these verses to you to show you just how valuable that searching of Scripture is. As you know, I've been doing my 
uh, devotions most recently in the book of Job. It's a sobering book to read. And as I've mentioned before, the reason Job is so interesting is the friends give all the right answers, but they give the right answers to the wrong problem. They have the wrong application. You can read the answers of the friends and you will find dozens of verses in there that you say, wow, that verse is really right on. Yes, but it didn't apply to Job. That was their problem. They didn't have the discernment to understand what was really going on with Job. They had no idea about the spiritual warfare that was taking place in the heavens where Satan had challenged God and God said, okay, you can put him to the test. And so they gave all the platitudes and the pious, pompous answers that were the answers to a different question. But listen to what Job has to say here. And it tells you something about the Bereans. Job 23.12 Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Now listen to what Job thought of the word of God. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Suppose you were in a concentration camp. And you're starving. And you're incredibly hungry. And so, time for the meal comes. You're only going to have 30 minutes to eat whatever little breadcrumbs and water they're going to give you. And you have a choice. Somebody says, I have a Bible. I'll let, it, I'll let you read it for 30 minutes while we're all eating. Which would you choose? Would you stuff your belly with the husks that the pigs eat? Or would you take the Bible and read as much as you possibly could in that 30 minutes? Job says, I have esteemed thy words more than my necessary food. Not the extra crackers and pie, but my necessary food. How much do you desire the Word of God? Let me read you another verse. This one is out of the book of Jeremiah, again comparing the scripture with food. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For, that means because, I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Yahweh Sabaoth. Are you hungry for the Word of God? Or do you think one meal a week, or if you come to morning and evening, two meals a week, is enough to sustain you? Thy words were found. That means he was looking for it. And I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any idea why David was called a man after God's own heart? Would you like to be called that? A man after God's own heart or a woman after God's own heart? We find the answer when we look at a few of the Psalms. I'm just going to give you some quotes out of Psalm 19, which you all know. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork out of Psalm 19, and then a few verses skipping very rapidly through Psalm 119. There are 172 verses in Psalm 119, every one of which deals with the Word of God. But among those ones that deal with the Word of God, they express multiple different things about how the Word of God, you know, how David hates the enemies of God because they don't like the Word of God. But there are other verses in that long psalm that describe David's desire for the Word of God and how valuable it was to him. Let me give you one first to start off with since we've been talking about the Word of God and food. This is from Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste! 
yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Now most of us like honey. I sure like honey. I just finished off a, um, a half gallon jar of buckwheat honey. I happen to like buckwheat honey. And uh, we bought it before Judy went to heaven. And it takes a while to get through a big jar like that. But this past week, I finally finished off the last. And you know what I did? Because it had started to crystallize around the sides and the bottom. Couldn't quite scrape it out with a knife. So I put some uh, water in it and um, sloshed it around, sloshed it around, sloshed it around, hot water, so that I could get all of it out. And then that last little bit, I poured on granola. <laughs> That was good, folks. <laughs> I mean, buckwheat honey has a distinct taste. So if you don't like buckwheat honey, I mean, you won't understand that. But uh, most of us like the clover honey. That's the really, really sweet stuff. Buckwheat honey has a distinct taste. But uh, man, was that good. I didn't want to waste even a drop of that. David says that's what the Bible is like to him. That's what God's words are like to him. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Like you might desire honey on a bagel or a piece of toast or you might desire honey on an English muffin or whatever you have to squirt honey into your cocoa or your coffee or your tea. David says, I would rather have the words of God's mouth than have honey. Imagine going without honey for the rest of your life. If you had to have a choice between that and be having the Word of God or whatever other sweet things you have honey or sugar or all the other kinds of goodies we have today jellies and jams and preserves and all of that kind of stuff you're gonna have to make a choice what are you gonna go without for the rest of your life I hope you choose you'd go without anything that has sweetness in it Psalm 19 verse 8 look at what David thought of the Word of God. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. You know, we get our jollies out of all kinds of things on earth here. I mean, we have fun with this and with that and with the other thing, and, and we enjoy doing those things. You know, I have fun seeing pictures of my grandkids. In fact, within the last week or so, I've had several people tell me how they see on Facebook. I don't even get to see these pictures. <laughs> I'm not on Facebook. My kids actually have to email the picture to me to bring it up on the screen and then I can't print it out. I enjoy that. It does bring joy to my heart. But it only brings joy to my heart because I know that my children are training their children in the Word of God. Somebody mentioned this morning that they had seen a, a picture of my, my tiniest granddaughter, the one that was born at four and a half pounds and that she was so cute. You know, I've only seen two pictures of her that Elijah sent to me over email. One of them you can actually see her face. The other one, it's mostly Elijah grinning. He has the baby in his arms, but her face is almost covered. You can see her forehead, and it's Daddy grinning there, you know? Well, that's fun. But what brings real joy to your heart? Do you find when you read the Word of God that it brings joy to your heart? The statutes of the Lord are right when you read the statutes of the Lord. Statutes, for David, dealt with the Old Testament law. Now, I cannot imagine, you know, if I read the Alabama Code, which is multi-volumes long, or the Federal Code, oh my, humongous, would that bring joy and rejoicing to my heart? Suppose I sit down and read a certain title out of the Alabama Code that deals with business corporation law, or that deals with criminal law, or that deals with contract law, or that deals with property law, would that bring joy and rejoicing to my heart? No. I do it because it's essential with certain clients. But David says, I'm reading your statutes. Not just reading the history of the Old Testament, not just reading the exciting stories of David and Goliath and Samuel, uh, uh, Daniel and the lion's den, <laughs> Samuel and the lion's den, that won't work. Um, reading those really exciting stories, he's reading statutes out of the law. And he says, those bring joy and rejoicing to my heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It gives you understanding. When you read the Bible, do you think, wow, this is making me sharper today. 
How about verse 9? The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. That's what brought joy to the heart of David. When he read that which was righteous, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Here he compares it to food and he compares it to money. Let me ask you a question. Do you view the Bible as having more value than gold? If you were on one of those quiz shows where, you know, they've got two things on the table over there. They've got one table stacked with hundred dollar bills and on the other table they've got a Bible. And suppose, now it's hard to be honest on this one, I know it is, but suppose they said, okay, you have five seconds to walk to either table. And in those five seconds, everything you can grab in your arms is yours. But imagine yourself not being able to go out and buy a Bible. There are countries like that where you can't go out and buy a Bible. Suppose you're very, very poor. You look at that piles of money, $100 bills, stacked like this. Huge stacks of $100 bills over there. And whatever you can pick up in five seconds is yours. And he says, go and the clock starts. Which table would you run to? Can you answer it? Can you answer it honestly? You'll probably never be put to that test, but God knows your heart. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. If you like candy, do you want the Bible more than you do chocolate? Verse 11, Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Folks, no matter what you get here on earth is tiny compared to eternal heavenly rewards. Every day, every one of us gives up heavenly rewards for some temporal, trivial thing on earth. That stuff from earth will burn up like fire. When we stand at the Bema Seat of Christ, our works are going to be brought before the Lord Jesus, and those things which were done to the glory of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and in obedience to the Word of God, those are the three tests for a good work. Those things that are done that way will receive a reward that will never fade away and will never perish. Everything else is going to be counted as wood, hay, and stubble. And it's going to burn up. It is going to burn up. You don't have to believe me. Read the scriptures. It's going to burn up. Are you thinking in terms of time right now? Are you thinking in terms of eternity? What is more valuable to you? What is more valuable to you? Why was David called a man after God's own heart? Because he desired the word of God more than anything else. Psalm 119. We've, we're leaving Psalm 19 now. We're going to Psalm 119. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking either to according to thy word. Now listen to this next phrase. Is this you? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. David sought God with his whole heart, and he knew it was focused on Scripture. That's how you seek God with your whole heart. Or is it sort of a byline for you throughout most of the week? Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. How much of God's word have you hidden in your heart to keep you from sin, which enables you to earn heavenly rewards? While you're walking in sin, you won't earn heavenly rewards. How about verse 15? I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Meditation takes time. You can't meditate in five minutes. 
Are you going to meditate in God's Word? Listen to the next few verses and listen for these words delight, longing, loved. There's, I'm skipping through the text, but I just picked up some verses that have those words in them. I will delight myself in thy statutes, I will not forget thy word. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Make me to go on the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts, quicken me in thy righteousness. I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Now, in that little run-through there, I skipped from verse 16 down to verse 48, lots of different little quotes in there, but did you pick up how much David delighted in the Lord's word? in the Bible, how much he longed for God's Word, how much he loved God's Word, how much he meditated in God's Word. Each of us has to ask ourselves the question, do I long for? Do I love? Do I delight in the Bible? A good way to compare that, if you wish, is think of loving and delighting in someone who is courting you or whom you are courting. Think back to your youth. Do you only want to spend 30 minutes a day with them? You know, when I was courting Judy, and I continued to court her after we were married, I continued to desire to have time with her. You know, it was several years after we were married before we ever had one day apart where I had to go speak someplace. I wanted to be with her all the time. Even after more than 40 years of marriage, I still wanted to be with her. I still courted her. We still had our date night at least once a week. We couldn't afford to do much. <laughs> You know that. But I would take her out to a Burger King, for example. Or maybe we'd just go and sit in the park if we could, didn't have enough money to go out and, with a coupon even, buy a hamburger that night. We delighted in each other's presence. That's the words that David is using here. Long for, longing, delighting, loving. Think of loving and delighting in someone who is courting you or whom you have courted. Do you only want to spend 30 minutes a day with them? You're busy watching your watch and 25 minutes is rolling around and you man, I've only got to spend five more minutes with this person. Is that how you felt? Or did the time go by so fast that you couldn't believe when the 30 minutes was up? And if you're a man and her dad had said, you have to have her home at 10 o'clock, and he didn't let you take her out till 9.30. <laughs> you thought, oh, no. Because he said, if I don't bring her in, you know, right on the dot at 10 o'clock, or five seconds earlier, I can't see her again for two weeks. You know the agony of it, don't you? You know the pain that you go through when you have to part. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Some words that I quoted to Judy as she lay dying. Sleep to thine eyes, peace to thy breast. Would I were sleep in peace so sweet to rest. Do you love the Bible more than that? I hope that I can say yes, I deeply loved my wife. But I love Jesus more. And I want to know more about what he has to say to me. I yearn for 
the Bible. I long for it. I delight in it. Verse 92, unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. That's more than 30 minutes a day, folks. Verse 127, therefore I love thy commandments above gold. Yea, above fine gold. Let me ask you a question. Do you love the Bible more than your paycheck? How much time do you spend every week working for money? Or if you're retired at this point, how much time did you spend every week working for money when you had a job? Have you ever spent that much time in any given week in your life devouring the scriptures. I opened my mouth and panted for I longed for thy commandments. It's a picture of someone struggling across the desert without water. Do you love the Bible more than water in the desert? Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Mine eyes prevent the night watches, that I might meditate in thy word. What did he say? Mine eyes prevent the night watches. Prevent is the old English word for precede. That is, he got up while it was still dark, because he loved the Bible so much. Do you get up while it's still dark to study the Bible? Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. That's an interesting comment. The people who do not seek God's statutes are the ones that God calls wicked. If that is what characterizes the wicked, what should characterize the saved? Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not. That is because they seek not thy statutes. Verse 159, Consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. David calls on God to look at his love for the word. Tonight, would you go home and say, God, I want you to look at me and see how much I love the Bible. Would you have the courage to do that? David did. David's called a man after God's own heart. Consider how I love thy precepts. Verse 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Now all of us have dreamed, I'm sure, at one time or another of finding buried treasure. I did as a little kid. Oh, I used to read all kinds of neat kid books, you know, about kids who went out and found buried treasure. Did you know people are still finding buried treasure today? As a matter of fact, this past week I got my, you know, bi-monthly edition of the Alabama Lawyer, which is the bar magazine put out by the Alabama Bar Association uh, and sent to all the lawyers who are licensed in the state of Alabama. And um, in it, it had a very interesting legal article. Of course, it was a legal article. That's the only reason I read it, of course, right? <laughs> it was about salvaging an entire shipload of Spanish doubloons. Wow. And it was, it was a shrimping boat that went out, and in one of its drags, it brought up this big mass of things that they began to realize as they you know, broke it apart. It was actually all these coins that had all gotten congealed together back from the 1500s. And um, so they dragged down again the same location. And this time the thing was so heavy they couldn't get it up so they had to call another shrimping boat over. And when the other shrimping boat found out what it was they said, well, we won't um, help you unless on this particular load everything that comes up belongs to us. 
But we'll help you with the rest of the salvage operation, but everything that comes on this load gets to us. So they lugged it up, and that load got over. This is a true story, folks. Uh, this is a, a legal case that went on. It was off the coast of Louisiana. It went over to the other shrinking boat. So they continued to work until they were more or less full, and the two crews decided they're not going to tell anybody about all these coins that they have found searching for hidden treasure. They carefully obviously marked the location. They want to be able to come back and find the rest of it because there seemed to be more of it down there. They got back to shore and the, the captains and the crews were dividing up their stuff and some of the crew members were way too eager to, to, to try to you know, hide it and so they began to sell off these very valuable silver coins. And um, Pretty soon the word got around that those shrimping boats had found coins. And the captain of one of the boats, the first boat that was there, went to his lawyer and said, how do we go about you know, following the law so that we can make sure that we get to keep the salvage, that, that it, it doesn't belong to somebody else? And in the process, the state of Louisiana found out about this treasure out there, and they claimed it, and they claimed that it was within Louisiana's territorial waters, so therefore all of the treasure belonged to the state of Louisiana. Well, things can get complex in the law. <laughs> Later it was discovered that it was just outside the territorial waters of Louisiana. So Louisiana had to drop that claim. Now with that in mind, go back to verse 162. I rejoice with thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Do you love the Bible more than buried treasure? Would you be excited if you happened to be walking along the beach and saw the corner of what looked like an old box sticking out and as you dug around that box the wood crumbled away and inside were gold coins or silver coins or precious jewels. Would you be excited? I think you probably would be. I think you probably would also do what those sailors tried to do. You'd try to hide it from everybody else. Do you love the Bible that much? David said he did. Verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, we live in a day and age where everything is a state of chaos. Everything is a mess. There's pressure everywhere. People are dying because of different kinds of stress in their lives. We're all the time stressed out. We're all the time way too busy. We're all the time just, you know, walking all over ourselves with too much going on. We have worries. We have concerns. We have stress. You know, this is one of the greatest promises, better than the buried treasure or anything else in there. It says, great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Nothing will trouble you. If you love the Word of God the way David loved the Word of God. Now, did David have stress in his life? You bet he did. He had all kinds of stress. And every time he disobeyed the Word of God, the stress got worse. You think about the Bathsheba incident. You think about the Sons of Rebellion incidences. You think about him fleeing through the wilderness in front of Saul. The times that he was in fellowship with God, he was at peace, regardless of external circumstances. The times that he was out of fellowship with God are the times when it got to him. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I added all that to what we studied last week because that was the key to the Bereans and why they were considered more noble than those in Thessalonica. And then the final key that we looked at last week was Paul's teaching with the scripture. They checked Paul out. The greatest Bible teacher other than our Lord Jesus Christ who ever lived. That shows the people were more serious about the scripture, not merely fulfilling their obligation to be in church one hour per week so they could be spoon-fed some kind of a pablum. That's what brings us to our verses for tonight. And that's a real sermon that I just gave to you too, but we'll look at some of the things in the text tonight. 
When the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him on to Athens, and received a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, and they departed. Now, there are six things I'm try to summarize if I possibly can in the next three minutes. That gives me 30 seconds on each one. Number one, remember how Paul had had persecutors who followed him from city to city until they caught up with him and stoned him before this at Iconium and Lystra and Derby. Here we have the same kind of a thing happening all over again. They'd managed to catch Paul the first time. Paul said, it's not going to happen again if I can help it. The believers there agreed with him. It's not going to happen again if we can help it. They'd managed to catch up with him before. After the, the whole town had come out with garlands and thought that he was Jupiter and uh, that the Barnabas was Jupiter and that Paul was a Mercury, the chief spokesman, they came out, they were going to do sacrifice to him. Paul ran among them and said, don't do that. We're just men like you are. Which, of course, put the priest of Jupiter in a rather embarrassing situation. And it's right at that point, precise timing, that these bad guys show up from the previous cities of Iconium and Lystra. And so they grab Paul and they stone him and they think he's dead. They leave him for dead. But God raised him up. And then Paul, instead of running, Paul did what most of us would not do. He walked back into town. But here he's not doing that. He's not going to go through this again. He's on his way out. The same thing is about to happen. And it always will happen. Whenever you become effective for Christ, the pagans will either try to kill you or they'll try to destroy you or they will try to gather crowds who will harass you or they will try to run you out of town when you become effective now most of us including this preacher here are not very effective and as a result for the most part they let the sleeping dogs lie folks if we became really effective do you know what we'd begin to suffer some persecution here in this place the second thing and we can talk more about that but second thing notice again that the entire church was involved in protecting Paul you know, that's a lot like the true believers in Europe who did so much to help the Jews during the Holocaust. Now, some of you know that my brother has put out a film called The Return to the Hiding Place. He's been having a difficult time getting it distributed because there's a major movie corporation who recently had um, their entire industry uh, hacked by computer hacks uh, to try to stop the release of a certain film about a certain dictator in a certain um, country in the Far East. You may have read about that. I'm probably sure you did uh, in the newspapers or magazines uh, because that company, that country wanted to make sure that this particular company did not release that film. Well, that's the same company that has offered my brother to take his film and they said, we'll distribute it because we've got the big distribution network, but we won't give you a dime for it. But your name will get out there. And he said no to that. Be in prayer about this because... Uh, there is several very large Christian ministries which suddenly have become interested in that film within the last 35, 45 days who would have the distribution network and who would also enable Peter to pay back those people who have invested in that particular film. Return to the Hiding Place, which is a story of young people in Holland during the Nazi occupation who rescued Jews along with Corrie ten Boom, but they were responsible, these young people, for rescuing an entire orphanage of Jewish children just minutes before the Nazis arrived to annihilate them. It's an incredible film. I hope you get to see it someday. There was very great danger to those who hid Jews. Remember that when you look here at the believers in Thessalonica and then as you look at the believers in Berea there was personal danger involved to them in hiding Paul out just like anybody who was hiding a Jew during the Holocaust was death on the spot if they got caught you know some time ago I saw another film called Hidden in Silence it's, it takes place in Eastern Europe it's a story not of some tough young men who are out there ready to fight for their country. It's the story of a 16-year-old girl. It's a true story. And she actually lived until just a few years ago. She married one of the guys whom she hid out. And they were married for more than 50 years. 
But it was a 16-year-old girl who hid a large group of Jews in her attic after the Jewish family that she was living with were taken to the concentration camps. And she had a little eight-year-old sister that she was taking care of at the same time. And she managed to scrounge up enough food to feed a whole group of adult Jews in her attic. And as the war was coming to the close, the Nazis came through the village where she was hiding these Jews, and they took over her house to use as part of their hospital operations for two Nazi nurses. And the Jews are hiding in the attic. She managed to get them all safely through the war. What would it have cost her if they had discovered that she was hiding Jews in the attic? It would have cost her her life. It would have cost the life of her little sister. Number three. Our text tonight makes it clear that there is nothing wrong in hiding other Christians when the government or radicals or other God-haters are seeking to destroy them. But just remember, if you do it, you may do it at a cost. <laughs> Number four, notice the word immediately in the text. That really stood out to me. Immediately. Did you know that survival is often a matter of being able to make a correct decision within seconds? I'm reading a very interesting book. I think I mentioned it the other day um, in one of my messages. It's a book called The Survivor's Club. And one whole section deals with airline crashes and how many people die in airline crashes. And um, what part of the plane is better to sit in uh, if you are going on an air flight and you want to uh, survive in case the plane crashes? Did you know there was one stewardess on an airline that crashed from an altitude of 33,000 feet who lived through the crash? That's something. And it was in the middle of the winter. And when the plane crashed, a guy who just happened to be a peasant in the local area there, this was in Europe, happened to see two legs sticking out of this crashed airplane, and he went over and pulled her out, and she was still alive. She'd actually been standing up, serving drinks, coffee and cocoa and snacks, when the plane went down. It was a terrorist attack. A bomb had gone off in the a compartment, the baggage compartment, when that plane crashed. She lived. Survival is often a matter of being able to make a correct decision within seconds. In airline crashes, it points out that many times people sitting side by side, one lives and one dies. They're sitting in the same row, they're sitting side by side in the seats, and sometimes the person who's actually wedged in next to the wall lives and the one on the aisle side dies and sometimes it's vice versa. And as they track these thousands of people who have survived airline crashes and ask them questions, they've come to the conclusion, and a lot of air safety is based on this today, what is it that enabled you to survive and somebody else not to survive? They made quick decisions. Immediately, that's the word that jumps out of the text here tonight. They were able to make intelligent decisions. They put their fear on hold. They said, what's the right choice to make? I'll do it. I'm not going to wait around for something to happen. One of those situations was people were heading out to get out of one of the exits over the wings, and there were like seven or eight people lined up, and smoke was already filling the plane, and a guy who was at the back of the line looked at that and said, I don't think I can get out this way. He dropped to his hands and knees. He began to crawl toward the front, which was where the plane had crashed. And as he got toward the front, he saw that there was a, a light. The, the plane had torn open on the side, and he managed to roll out and fall 13 feet, I believe it was, to the ground. And about three seconds later, the plane was engulfed in flames. And when they went in and found the bodies later, those seven people that had been ahead of him, who were patiently waiting to try to get out of the, the door over the wing, which is not a full-size opening, were all found in charred ruins. The believers at Berea responded instantly. 
And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. Point number five, and I've gone over my time. Notice that they used a ruse. They pretended to send Paul to the docks to get on a boat. They sent away Paul as to go, to go as it were, to the sea. Because that wasn't really where he was going. They used a ruse. They pretended to send Paul to the docks on a boat, but they personally brought him to Athens. It says, and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. Paul didn't get sent out and they told him, run down to the docks. Here's some money. Buy a passage on the boat. Though it may have appeared to some other people that's what was happening. You know, I get from this that there's nothing wrong in confusing the enemies of the gospel. Nothing wrong in confusing the enemies of the gospel. Number six, and this goes hand in hand with number five. Note that they used what's been called an old maxim. It dates back to Julius Caesar. Divide and conquer. They split up the evangelistic team because that was more difficult to track. They took Paul one way and then they sent Silas and Timotheus a different way or hid them someplace. Because it says that when he got to Athens, they, he, Paul gave him a commandment unto Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, and they departed. They divided to conquer. They split up the team because that would be more, more difficult to track. And then the team reassembles later, as we'll see in the text. They moved with speed. They didn't putter around. You understand that when we read the book of Acts, it's not just an exciting story. It's not just so that we'll know some theological events that took place during the historical period in which the apostles were still alive. It's telling us some very practical things that if we pay attention, we might learn something in case there are times of persecution that come on the church today. Well, I'm ten minutes over time. Okay, let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray, Father, that you will cause us to be sensitive to the word of God, that we will desire it more than our necessary food, that it will be more valuable to us than gold, yea, than much fine gold, that it will be more precious to us and we'll search for it more diligently than we would for, for hidden treasure that we knew was out there, that we had to have a choice between all the things that the world counts as valuable on one table and the Bible on the other table, that without even thinking about it, we'd take the Bible. Teach us to love your word, to really love it, like a fiancé loves his fiancé. Father, teach us to delight in your word, as a young man delights in the presence of the young woman whom he loves, and more so, with your word. Teach us to long for it when we don't have it, that it's like being in the desert without water, it's like being in a starvation camp without food. Make it the joy and delight and rejoicing of our hearts. We pray these things, Father, in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. For someday we will stand before him, and that will be one of the questions, is how much did you love my word? How much time did you spend in my word? How much time did you want to know me better? Father, we pray that you'll take your word as preached tonight and use it in each one of our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight.